This is WPSL Port St. Lucie, the talk of the Treasure Coast. The opinions on this program are those of the program host and guest and not necessarily those of WPSL. WPSL does not endorse products that may be mentioned. Any reproduction or retransmission of this broadcast is strictly prohibited without written consent of WPSL. Legal questions? Ask a lawyer. Give us a call at 340-1590. 340-1590 here at the studios of WPSL. And Ask a Lawyer with your host, Attorney Stuart M. Address. Good morning. I am Stuart Address, and this is Friday at 10 o'clock or so. And this is Ask a Lawyer. Um, so give us a call at 340-1590. I'll be happy to try to answer your calls in between the uh, you know, the topic of the day. But we do have one call waiting already, and that is John on line one. So, hello, John. How can I help you? Hey, can I ask you a twofer? I have a friend that had a You can ask me a question and a follow-up. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're two different questions. I just want to make sure. But anyway, my friend, is there a statute of limitations for collection agencies in the state of Florida? I am certain there is. Um Without my trusty law books in front of me, I don't. I couldn't be precise, but I'm going to but assume. But generally speaking, they have like maybe four, five, six, seven years. Well, it is, it, yes, it is. It is. <laughs> it is one of those numbers for sure. Um, chapter 95 of Florida statutes has the statute of limitations for virtually everything. Uh, I do know that some people make a mistake; they make a small payment, and that restarts the statute of limitations from the beginning. So if the so statute's about question. to run out, excuse me? That's a good question. When exactly does it begin, assuming there are no payments? Well, it, it, it begins when the debt is incurred. That's when the statute so the date, is... If it's a medical bill, the date you incurred that. It's not the date you received the notice. No, I would say it's the date that the service was provided um, and the debt was incurred. And so then if, you know, let's just hypothetically say... Um, it's six years. I'm not sure it is, but let's say it's six years and at five years and six months, all of a sudden you start getting all these collection letters. Um, that's because they realize the statute's about to run out. And the problem that some people make is a, they make a small payment to try to ward off the collection agency. And that starts the statute from the beginning. So for those people who, uh, the statute's about to run, uh, my best advice is avoid the collection agency. And there's a very easy way to do that, by the way. Um, people if, it, if it is six years, let's say, and they don't send any letters, all, all they do is phone calls and no letters, don't they have to get a judgment? And don't they have to notify Well, they always have the to get a judgment. I mean, phone call or letter doesn't matter. They always have to get a judgment. And the action has to be filed within the statute of limitations. But if no judgment has been made in six years... No, 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 no. It's not, the statute of limitations is not for the judgment. It's for filing the lawsuit. Well, that's just it. If they haven't filed a lawsuit, then what happens after six years? Well, if, if the statute is six years, then the debt is it's gone. It's bye-bye. So they can't harass her, my friend, after six years. Again, you're saying six years. I'm not sure. but No, no, we're just assuming. Right. We're Whatever the statute is, once that statute has expired... Yeah. If they start harassing, she has rights under the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. Um, you, know, you have rights even beforehand. If you're getting all these letters from collection agencies and you want to stop it, all you really have to do, lawyer or no lawyer, is send, you know, like a one-sentence letter saying, you know, please cease all communications with me, you know, pursuant to the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, except for service of process. Then yeah. nobody's allowed to contact you. Unless you're being served with a summons complaint for a lawsuit. Is that a state yeah. or is that a federal act? That's federal law. That is a federal law. Okay. Fair yeah, Debt so Collection so you Practices Act. have to send you like a certified letter saying we're suing you. No. Again, service of process has to be affected however the law is of the state. Now, if it's a small claims matter, the court's going to send a certified letter. If it is outside of small claims in county or circuit court, you're most likely going to be served by a process server. Okay, but one way or the other, you're definitely going to know 
you know, she's going to know she's being sued one way or another. Whether oh, I would think so. And, and you know, yeah. in those in those unusual instances, and they do happen, where yeah. service of process is not appropriate, not proper, or not even done. It's called garbage service. Um, yeah. You know, and a judgment is obtained. Then you got to go through the process of moving to vacate. Well, thank you. And and what I wanted to ask was, um, if a homeowner association sends you a threatening letter to cease and desist, and it's, of course, through their attorney, and you read the letter and you say, what the hell is this? I mean, it's one thing if you've done it, but if you if they list A, B, and C, and you you really haven't done anything, you haven't done A, you haven't done B, and you haven't done C, would you answer the letter, or, or would you just say, "Look, this is garbage"? No, I would. I, w- I would not ignore it. If you've gotten a letter from an attorney, then I would suggest that you contact an attorney to respond to that letter and to try to clarify the fact that maybe there's a mistake. Because if you ignore the letter from the attorney, uh, the next thing you know, in an HOA, there's going to be fines assessed. Then there's going to be a lien put on the home, and then you're going to have a lawsuit against you. So yeah. I would not ignore it. Now, if you get a letter from the HOA, you know, cease and desist or a notice to cure, then I would say, you know, maybe just respond to that directly to the HOA. You start without an attorney. It, you know, doesn't pay to hire an attorney for something like that if you don't have to. You know, and just say yeah. to the HOA, I got this notice. I don't know what you're talking about. You know, one, two, and four are things that I've never done. Three I've already solved. So, you know, what do you want to do about this? And at least yeah. then you have a record that you've tried to address the issue. And I, I, always, I always want a written record. I mean, I don't always I get am, it as a lawyer, but I always want a written record. I, I tend to agree with you. It's just that, you know, sometimes when you send back a letter, then they send another, and it gets into a, a, a pissing match. And all it was was a cease and desist, even though it had nothing to do with me, even though they thought it had something to do with me, I figure, look, they're not threatening me with anything. They're just saying I did something, which I didn't do, and to stop doing it. But then the scary part is, well, wait a minute. Um, if they said I did something and I didn't do it, what about the future? What's stopping them from Well, uh, that, that's it. So, I mean, accu- if, if I'm accused of doing something I didn't do, I'm at least going to respond that I think you're in error. You can yeah, always okay. go to a thrilling HOA meeting. Yeah, you can do one of those things. <laughs> and, uh, well, the thing is, in the letter, it says i got to deal with the attorney. Well, yes, if you've gotten something from the attorney, you're going to have to deal with the attorney. They're, they're, they're yeah, probably yeah, going to refuse to You can't go to a homeowners you. association meeting no. and say, listen, you guys, you're a bunch of idiots. You know, you're, I don't no, know that, where that's you why I'm saying it. if you got something from an attorney, it's time for an attorney to respond to it. Yeah, that's the, that's the hard part. You know, it's like now it's going to cost me money just to answer a silly letter. That, I, I hear you. I, and, and, and trust me, I, I'm being sincere. I feel your pain. Um, <laughs> people don't like to pay lawyers. People don't like to pay dentists. Uh, I, I don't. Hey, no, you're wrong there. I like to pay a lawyer when I need a lawyer. And you just don't want to pay him when you don't need one. Well, this is ridiculous. I mean, if it was something I really needed a lawyer for, yes, of course. But uh, you know, if it's some wild accusation, Th- that's why hopefully a lawyer can solve it very quickly. Um, if you're dealing with reasonable counsel on the other side, they sometimes they're not. They didn't even provide any substantial evidence in the letter. It's just all hearsay, accusations. I mean, isn't that like slander? No, it's not slander. It is an exception. First of all, it's not published to a third party. It's to you. Um, so, no, it's not slander. So they don't have to provide any substantial Absolutely not. I would never provide that supporting documentation when I'm sending out a demand letter. Why should I show my hand? Well, <laughs> well if you know someone's guilty, you, you might as well just show them why they're guilty. Oh, I disagree. I do. That's what litigation oh. is for. See, now you're playing chess. Now you're playing chess, and that's why. Well, I but I like do. But I do that on on behalf of the individuals as opposed to the entities. Well, this is a homeowners association. I'm not talking about an individual. I'm talking about a homeowner. Well, no, I know. So I, I would do that on behalf of the homeowner as opposed to yeah. showing my hand to an HOA. It's one thing uh, if you were representing me as the individual being attacked on on un, uh, unsubstantiated. Right. Yes, I might tell you that, but that would be to answer an accusation. If somebody makes an accusation, they should come out, it's something as small as this, and tell exactly, listen, we have evidence, this is the evidence, and if the person is guilty, the person is guilty. I mean, why prolong the issue? In a perfect world, I would agree with you, but this is, this is the re- unfortunately, the real world, and you're not going to get letters like that. 
Um, Listen, I'm over. I'm over sixty. I know what the real world is like, and that's the problem. Well, I'm approaching it. Years, people acted like children, and they said, "Like, I'm not going to tell him until you know. I'm not going to show you until you show me." I mean, that's what we do when we're six, seven years old. And to me, you do it in the the sandbox, and you do it in the courtroom. (laughs) I think. I think the law profession would go up a couple of notches if it probably would. When I was in high school, being a lawyer was the number two most prestigious job you could have, and now it's uh, just above used car salesman. And yeah. I'm, being, I'm being serious about that. Yeah, and slipping below that, too. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, thanks very much, John. I appreciate your call. I, hey, listen, thanks for putting up with me. I appreciate <laughs> it. That's all right. Take care. You uh, too. All right, folks, so what's the moral of the story? <laughs> uh, give me your phone number. Oh. <laughs> the, the, the moral of the story is whenever you get a threatening letter from a lawyer, please don't try to handle it yourself. Don't shred it. <laughs> you, you, whatever you say, let's, you know, if to follow the old sayings, you know, on I think it's Dragnet, old, old show, maybe you don't realize it. But, you know, if you try to respond to the lawyer, anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. An attorney is going to write it as a settlement communication, which is a privilege. So that what is said cannot be used in court. Unless you do it the right way, you're going to step on a landmine. And anything you say, they're going to use against you in court by showing your email or your letter or whatever it is. So when you get something from an attorney, I would take it seriously. Get something from the HOA, yeah, I'd take it seriously too. But I think there, there's an opportunity for you to try to address it you know, directly with the board and see if it could be resolved, you know, in a rational, civil manner. Um, when I get calls about HOAs, uh, rational it's and civil. It's not rational yeah, and civil. Rational and civil are not the words I would use. <laughs> um, sometimes I would use vendetta, selective enforcement, you know, all sorts of things. But rational and civil <laughs> is, is not what I would use for an HOA. And that's why when I was looking for a new home, I really did not want to go into a planned community. Really? Uh, Because I did not want to have an HOA telling me uh, I let my grass grow an extra quarter of an inch. Yeah. Or no, you can't paint your house lime green. It can only be yellow. I just didn't want to deal with that baloney. Um, So so I I moved to a new house and all of a sudden code enforcement shows up. I guess you can't (laughs) win. Quick story and then we go to the real topic. I move into a new house. (laughs) Code enforcement shows up. They say that two palm trees that are on either side of the driveway are in the swale, which is owned by the city, and therefore must be removed. Now, these trees were there since the house was built. It wasn't like I planted them. And so... Which was when? When was the house built? Ten years ago. Okay, okay. So I go into the the Code of Ordinances Mm -hmm. for Mm -hmm. Port St. Lucie. And I find the offending statute, or ordinance, actually. And it says what it says. Ah, but it says something else also. Uh Uh-oh. That if that tree or shrub or what have you is within a three-feet diameter of a mailbox, it's exempted. So I could save one of my two trees because it was next to the mailbox. So I call back the code enforcement officer who first of all tells me there was really no vendetta against me, but usually what happens is if somebody in the neighborhood got cited for something, they end up driving around the whole neighborhood. Sure. Oh, and then yeah. they call on everybody they see, because if they have to do it, well, everybody has sure. to do it. Sure. Oh, yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I said, look, you know, I, can't, I don't have to remove the one on the left of my driveway. It's near the mailbox. And he, he says, well, you're right. I said, so come on. I mean, do you really, you know, can it be reasonable? You don't want to have a lopsided, you know, uh, landscaping. I said, what's the big deal? It's It's been there for 10 years. Now, I might have had to fight that in front of, you know, the, the code enforcement judge, and I might very well have lost. Uh, but in this instance, I had a code enforcement officer, um, few and far between maybe, and please, I'm not trying to offend code enforcement, don't come after me, but who was very helpful and got in touch with his supervisor and told me to forget about it that they weren't going to push for me to remove those two little palm trees. So I prevailed. But then again, I'm a lawyer. I went to the code. I looked for it. I found the exception. I argued it. If it happened to you and you really wanted to keep those trees or what have you, 
you might have to consult a, a lawyer. And they know how to look up these things and where to look and try to find the things that they're not telling you about that might give you an opening, you know, to keep whatever it is you want to keep or do whatever it is you want to do. And and you'll see Stewart on his ladder painting his house lime green this weekend. No, you oh. will not. I, as, as, my, as my girlfriend likes to say, and I do believe she's watching, I don't do hardware. You know, I mean, you're not going to find me on a ladder. I, I have I have diabetic neuropathy in my feet. I ain't going on no ladder. Yeah. All right. So, you know, uh, change a light bulb. Well, if I can't reach it, I, I give a yell, and the yell goes something like this: "Aaron!" <laughs> That's my son, by the way. That's right. Now, what happens when he moves out of the house after high school? I don't know. It's funny you mention that. Doctor Sellards was talking on the Bone Talk Show about um, um, injuries and how the changing of light bulbs. You know, when you all of a sudden get dizzy when, you, you know, you're looking one way or the right, other. Right, right. Um, uh, and you fall off. And he said that's one of the leading causes of injuries. That's a great reason for me not to get on a ladder. <laughs> so I'm going to take the doctor's advice. <laughs> all right. So, you know, you know, last week, um, first of all, because we had the call, I, I forgot to do this at the top of the show. Uh, last week we had David Miklas here, uh, an attorney who represents employers and in employment matters. And he's a good friend of mine. He's a co-chair with me on the Martin County Labor and Employment Law Committee. Um, had some good information. And I'd really like to thank him for coming on the show last week. Uh, I think it was a fun show, a lot of back and forth give and take. And we're going to try to do that a little bit more often, uh, bring in some colleagues of mine in different areas of law and, and see what they might be able to tell you. Uh, and I'll remind you to give me a call at 340-1590. So one of the things we were talking about briefly last week, because we never really got to it in detail, was the Family and Medical Leave Act. And I thought that that could be our topic for the next oh, 35 minutes, unless I'm bombarded with questions, which would be wonderful, uh, in which case we'd postpone it to next week. But Family and Medical Leave Act, we are getting a lot of calls in my office about people who want to take leave for either a medical situation of their own or a medical situation of their kid or their parents or their grandparents or their um, live-in boyfriend or girlfriend. And some of them have viable cases and some of them don't. And some of them need to request FMLA leave and you know, some of them have been offered it or haven't been offered it, which is a violation. So I figured let, let's run through a lot of the, the basics that um, are, are things that we answer, it seems like, on a weekly basis right now. First of all, the, the FMLA is really a wonderful statute. Uh, it is the beginning, in my view, of giving employees rights that are logical and people should have. And they really do have in a lot of the European countries. And again, this is a federal law. Federal law, okay. absolutely, yes. Good. And it protects people who need certain types of leave. Uh, and there are certain requirements. First of all, it only applies to companies who have 50 or more employees within 75 miles of where you work. So if you work for a company that has branches in Orlando or what have you, as long as it mounts to 75, that is a covered employer. 15, no. 27, no. And, and that gets to be a problem. And we will continue with that And after Jim on line one. Hello, Jim. Hello, sir. How I can I help you? Question. I have a question that's not related to family medical. Oh, leave, that's okay. But, uh, <laughs> okay, great, man. Um, uh, it's an HOA question. Oh, another HOA question. Oh, All right. Those, 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 those uh, deadly HOAs. Yes. Um, uh, we get lots of calls on HOAs, too. Yes, sir. Um, if, the, if I have a uh, leak in my condominium and uh, they don't move to get it fixed in a timely manner, do I have any recourse on that? Yes, you do. Um, 
the leak within your unit, it's a unit you own? Yes, sir. And do you know where the leak is coming from, what the cause of the leak is? Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's coming from the outside, and uh, this is one of those uh, deals to where they are responsible for everything from payout. Exactly, out. exactly. That's what I was trying to figure out. So, yes. So the HOA is responsible for that type of a leak, and if they don't do right. something in a timely fashion, you know, the first thing I do is, of course, I put them on written notice. And if put they them on what? On written notice. Okay. Whether okay. it's an email, a fax, certified letter, whatever it is. I make sure that my request to them to fix this is in writing and that the fact that it is causing damage to the interior of my unit, which is my responsibility, that's yes, occurring and they need to remedy it. Now and they, it is. Okay, and now let's say they, they don't act in a timely fashion. Then, depending upon how serious the leak is, you may or may not be able to give a statutory notice that the premises are partially or substantially uninhabitable. Now, that really depends upon degree. If that's the case, you're allowed to withhold rent from the time you give that statutory notice. Which would be my HOA fees you're talking about. Well, right, and HOA fees. Um, you also can look at the governing documents, you know, the Declaration of Covenants, the bylaws and the rules and regulations. They usually will tell you what your rights are. You obviously have the right to take the HOA to court. And very often, you know, you don't have to go that far. But if you do, in the interim, I would be at least getting an estimate on my own for the repairs, again, presenting that to the HOA before I take any action on my own, that's going to cost me money. Um, but at least then, you know, now you've shown that, you know, you, you've gotten an estimate. They have an obligation to do it, assuming they do under their covenants and bylaws and rules and regulations. And then if nothing is done, depending upon how bad the situation is, there's one of two things you can do. One is you start making the repairs yourself. Or you, you get a lawyer, you know, and file a lawsuit um, for declaratory judgment that it's their obligation and also perhaps for an injunction um, that they'd be required to start working on it right now. Yeah, and since I do rent that unit, I mean, there could come a period of time that I would run into a situation where I couldn't, those pe the people there wouldn't be able to stay there because of, in Florida, mold. Right. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. And so, okay. So you're a landlord of people who are renting your unit. So as, since you're the owner, of course, you have the rights to communicate with the HOA. The tenant really would not. Uh, and if you if you lose your tenant, uh, those are damages that you incur, and the HOA may end up being responsible if they haven't acted in a timely fashion to remedy a problem like that. That is their obligation and responsibility. Yeah, the first thing I'm going to do is ask them to put a tarp up there and uh, at least stop the damage. Exactly. Uh, I mean, in any insurance situation, you know, HOA, insurance law, you have the right to take certain remedial steps to minimize the damage, to protect, you know, your property from damage. Okay. And, and nobody can really complain about that. Well, okay. Okay. I really appreciate your help. You're welcome. Good luck. If uh, you need us, give us a call. Cheryl's not in today because yep. she's out ill. I don't know if she's listening to the show, but our number is 781-8003. All right, I will. And All right, take care. care. I don't have to sue myself. <laughs> yeah, no, we don't want you to sue yourself, uh, you know, because then, you'll be, pay away, then you'll be paying an attorney on both ends. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Oh, okay, because all of a sudden it went <laughs> shifted from the owner to Now, you to see, that's what, okay, that, that's what happens when, when we get calls in our office. This is uh -huh. why Cheryl, Cheryl will typically spend 20 minutes, sometimes more, with a prospective client on the phone getting information before she comes to talk to me. Because as you go through the discussion, you start to hear other pieces of information that may change the complexion of the whole issue you're discussing. Or give you another avenue to start talking about or asking questions about. And so that is really why, you know, we go through like a, a debrief or people don't like the word screening. So I'll call it a debrief. 
you know, and asking people lots of questions about their situation. And, you know, sometimes Cheryl will get, well, why do you, why do you have to ask me so many questions? Well, the real reason is so that we can try to determine whether you really have a claim and what your rights may be so that when Cheryl comes to talk to me, I can try to make a, a good assessment of the situation um, and either suggest that, you know, maybe you want to come in for a consultation and we, we deal with it a lot more and I look at documents, or it may be a situation where I could easily determine, uh, tell them they should really do this and it's done and you don't need to hire me, or you don't really have a case at all and I will authorize Cheryl to explain why because as a paralegal, Cheryl's not allowed to give a legal opinion or legal advice. So she can only do what I authorize her to do. So she can take information, she can be sympathetic, but she can't tell you what to do or what your rights are, um, or I would chop her head off. That's only because the bar would chop my head off. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Remind me not to come to work for you. If oh. being a lawyer is dangerous work. <laughs> Very dangerous. you got to deal with nasty letters and paper cuts and, you know. <laughs> All right, so going back to the FMLA, we were talking about, okay, 50 employees in a 75-mile radius. Also, you have to have been employed for at least one year with that employer and have worked 1,250 hours. Now, most all full-time employees are going to meet that. Uh, some part-time employees will meet that, too. So those are sort of the threshold requirements. So now, let's say you're in a situation where you meet those requirements. All right. If you are trying to get FMLA, FMLA leave, there are only certain situations where it applies. And it sounds simple, but nothing is ever black and white, unfortunately. It applies if you are asking for leave for the birth of a son or a daughter, or the placement of a son or daughter um, for adoption or foster care. Um, Son and daughter has to be defined. It is defined in the statute. It's not so simple. Son and daughter is defined as a biological, adopted, or foster child, a stepchild, a legal ward, or a child of a person standing in loco parentis. I love Latin. So, you know, it's not just your kid. It could be your stepkid. It could be an adopted kid. It could be a foster kid in loco parentis. It could be an exchange student who you're responsible for for the next semester or next year. Ooh, never thought you, of that You are one. acting in loco parentis, and loco parentis means, in Latin means as the parent. It could be if you're the grandmother and the child is living with you, you're acting in loco parentis. And there's a lot of that now. Yes. So while it technically does not cover a grandmother and a grandchild, it would if you're acting in loco parentis. So, you know, defining son or daughter is, is not so simple. Yeah. I <laughs> Don't you just love the law? Yeah. All right. Now, you can also get leave to care for a spouse, um, a son or a daughter, or a parent who has a serious health condition. Now, of course, serious is also defined. We won't get into that right now because that could take a whole show. A parent is defined. What is a parent? Well, it's defined broadly as a biological, adoptive, step, or foster parent, or a person who has stood in loco parentis, caring for a child. All right. Now, here's an interesting exception. Parent does not mean uh, somebody who is dealing with their in-laws or their, in the reverse way, um, well, okay. You can't take leave if you're trying to care for your mother-in-law or your father-in-law. Something like that. It doesn't count. You wouldn't want to do that for your mother-in-law. <laughs> well, some anyway. people might. Oh, I'm but sorry. It, it, it's excluded from the statute. <laughs> all right? It also does not include grandparents. So my grandmother, let's say, is in the hospital um, God forbid. Um, well, mine are gone, unfortunately. But uh, grandmother's in the hospital, let's say, for cancer. 
and you really, you know, you want to go care for her. Sure. Um, unfortunately, you do not have rights under the FMLA because it does not cover grandparents. I would think family is family. Well, I would too, but they only go to a certain level. So that that you know, people say, well, I, I hear you can take care when it's a family member. Yeah, you can, but family only goes so far, uh, and. It's nice when you want to go further, but the statute isn't always up to date uh, in terms of um, societal realities. Gotcha. So, yeah. And in this day and age, I don't see it being amended anytime soon. Now, of course, I'm not going to get political, but you know, if the Democrats were to win the White House and to win both the House and the Senate, then a lot can get done. And okay, to make, be fair, I don't want this to happen, but if Trump were to win again and the Republicans were to get the House and the Senate. They'd be able to do almost what they want. And that's just the way it works. It's, we don't compromise anymore. Basically, you got to win it all uh, to do much of anything. But nobody does anything in D.C. anyway, so you don't have to worry about either party. You know, sometimes I wonder how these types of statutes really got enacted. <laughs> uh, and the truth is they got enacted a while ago when Republicans compromised with Democrats and Democrats compromised with Republicans and created legislation which wasn't perfect, but it was good enough for now because that's what they were able to agree upon you know sometimes you get half a loaf it's a lot better than no loaf at all and well i would like to see the fmla amended so that it's less than 50 it's not happening anytime soon so what happens to somebody in like an organization like ours less than 20 employees um that wants to at will employee if you don't want to give them the leave you're fired Oh, God. <laughs> Up to you. I mean, it's that, it could be that callous. Whoa. Or it could be that, what's the opposite word of callous, uh, that compassionate. Uh, I have heard of, of employers giving leave that they don't have to give. I have heard of employers who do have to give the 12 weeks giving more voluntarily. Uh, there are good employers out there. There are employers who care, um, and then there are those that uh, don't or that need a lawyer to push them around a little bit, and that's where I come in. You know, uh, again, I don't know if Cheryl is listening or not because I got a text early this morning that she wasn't feeling well, but, you know, she's my only employee, and I joke around with her that I'm allowed to sexually harass her if I want to because it's not sexual harassment. <laughs> Now, by the way, folks, I don't. But I can if I want to. Well, but then again, my girlfriend would kill me. So I really can't. <laughs> All right. But I also, you know, she often will say to me, um, you know, can I come in late? Can I leave a little early? Uh, I want to go to one of my daughter's uh, recitals or a parent-teacher conference or take them to the doctor or what have you. Normal, routine, parental obligations, responsibilities, and even joys. You want to go see a recital or something that's at 10 a.m. I could say no. Absolutely I could say no. I could say, if you want to go, then don't come back. I have heard employers that do that. And we get these see, I calls. I can't even comprehend that. We get these calls, and I have to say, I'm sorry. There is nothing we can do for you. You're an at-will employee. This isn't a violation of the law. However, to make a plea for anybody who might be an employer out there and might be listening and you know, might have rights uh, with respect to at-will employees, I don't do that with Cheryl. I don't do it, number one, because I'm a parent, too, and I understand the obligations and the things that come up. I also don't do it because I believe that you're going to get the best out of your employee and you're going to get more loyalty if you treat them the way they would like to be treated. And sure. if you need to be out or you need to you know, come in late and you're not doing it you know, four times a week or something and abusing it, um, I, I, I don't think, and Cheryl will probably call and correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think in the three plus years that Cheryl's been my paralegal that I have ever said no to one of those requests. And I hope that by doing so, I've earned some loyalty and some hard work. Because 
when you have a boss that's a jerk, uh, you might do your job, but, you know, sort of like the blue flu. You might just do your job and not go beyond in any in any way or imagination. And you're always looking at that green pasture across the street. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you get five cents an hour more, bolt, bolt, bolt for the new job. Um, but... You know, sometimes if you're getting something non-economic like this, you, you have freedom of movement and access to take care of your family, uh, that's worth a, a certain price. And, you know, I know when I was an employee, uh, I certainly wanted that freedom, and sometimes I got it and sometimes I didn't. All right, so now. You know, it's funny. Carol and I work for a relatively large broadcast company in uh, in San Diego, and it and they used to give us a lot of comp time, especially in right. the sports department because if we're on the road with somebody and stuff like that. Um, and news director always would say, take what you need, I'll deal with management. <laughs> and that was, that was it. I, and I, I, you know, I think it, that's the way it should be, really. Uh, unless employees are taking advantage of something, you need to deal with the realities of life on the ground, not – and a black and white statute. And no matter how hard people may try, black and white letters in a law cannot consider every contingency. And so if it doesn't cover something, it doesn't mean that if you were to present it to the legislature today and they were to actually act on it, they might not amend it and include it. It doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. It's just a matter of, you know, how do you want to treat your employees do you, do you do you want to operate and do you believe your employees will do the best for you if you instill fear? <laughs> I know somebody uh, in a pretty white house that does that. Um, or do you want to treat your employees in a way that you're still the boss, but you treat them with dignity and respect and you hope that that earns you at a minimum some loyalty and some hard work? Number one television station in Los Angeles had this sign above the news department. Um, when you walk through these doors, you must fear for your job. Yeah, Whoa, yeah. man! I was like, and, and, you know, <laughs> look at that going. Right, on. And I, 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 I don't think with well, like never work. Everybody, there. you know, people have like seven. If you look at it, seven different personality types in general exist. There are some personality types that respond favorably to that threat. Okay, there are other personality types who will immediately rebel against that threat. You deal with a lot of sports. You cover a lot of sports. It, coaches now know they didn't in the past. Coaches now know that you don't treat everybody on the team yeah. the same. Yeah, that's that true. is the wrong way to approach it. If Johnny needs a kick in the butt to give his best effort, you give him a kick in the butt verbally, of course. But if, if Ralph needs some encouragement and, you know, some, come on, you can do it, go get out there, then Ralph needs some encouragement. Different people have different personalities and different things motivate them. And if you try to figure out what motivates different people, let's say, in your office, you can treat them differently as long as it's not illegally differently. But you can try to treat them differently to motivate them the best. Uh, I would hope that it would be in a professional and pleasant way. But, there, you know, there are employees who like to kick butt, and sometimes it works. I just don't think it's helpful um, when you need time off to care for yourself or family members or a kid or, you know, I know somebody who wasn't allowed to go to a middle school graduation. You know, it's like you can't go to your own kid's graduation during the day. Oh. Come on. If I'm you, go look for another job. You don't want to be there. Yeah, that's awful. Gosh. All right. So as uh, we keep an eye on the 4 o'clock. 14 minutes right. left. What, what, what is an employer prohibited from doing in general? All right. An employer is prohibited from interfering with, restraining, or denying the exercise of your FMLA rights. An employee is prohibited from discriminating or retaliating retaliating against an employee or even a prospective employee from having exercised or attempted to exercise FMLA rights. They are prohibited 
from discriminating against any other person, whether or not an employee, for opposing or complaining about any unlawful practice under the FMLA. So if somebody wants to take FMLA and the employer is not doing what they're supposed to do and you bring that to their attention, you know, you need to give, um, we'll use a female's name this time, you need to give um, Janet, uh, you know, time off to care for her mother. You're fired. You now have a cause of action. But you have a cause of action under the Whistleblower Act, and you actually have a cause of action under the FMLA. Do you have to give your employer something in writing? You don't. No? You don't. But, you know, when you call my office and you tell me this is what happened, unless there's some good evidence four people that are witnesses that are going to give me affidavits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know that I, I'm willing to start a lawsuit on a contingency fee basis unless I have some proof because it takes up a lot of my time. And I'm looking for the stronger case I can find. So, yeah, I always prefer a writing. Don't always get it, but it's what I prefer. Um, now, examples of prohibited conduct. You don't authorize FMLA leave when it should be authorized. You discourage a person from using their FMLA. So you don't say no, but you make it fairly clear that you're not going to be real happy if they do. That's a violation of the FMLA. You manipulate their work hours so that they're not eligible for FMLA. That's retaliation, though, right? Well, that's interference. Interference. <laughs> okay. You use their request for FMLA or their actual use of FMLA as a negative factor in a review or a promotion or a bonus or whatever. If you're able to prove that, that it's a violation of the FMLA. And employers that do this, there are really two types of FMLA actions, interference and retaliation. Retaliation comes most often when you're coming back from FMLA. But before I get to the coming back, you know, let me say one other thing about getting FMLA leave. Because, I mean, I had a two-week federal trial some years back that started in this manner. The FMLA is an amazing statute from the employee's perspective. It is different than almost any other federal statute I know of. For example, and, and we did talk about this with David Nicholas last week a little bit. If you feel you're being discriminated against on gender, race, age, whatever, under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, you have to complain. You have to give the employer a chance to investigate and fix it. So you have an obligation. Under the FMLA, it's reversed. The employer has an obligation. If the employer hears, whether from you, scuttlebutt, rumor, cafeteria talk, whatever, if the employer gets information which leads them to believe that you might be entitled to FMLA, they have an affirmative obligation to let you know and to give you the federal FMLA packet of documents. So you don't even have to know FMLA exists. If they don't give you the documents and they know that your, your, your husband or your spouse you know, has cancer and is going to be needing chemotherapy and you're asking for time off to go on visits and they don't tell you about the FMLA and give you the documents, they have violated the FMLA. Shouldn't that be in your employee handbook? It should be, but not every company has a handbook. That's true. That, that's touch. Not every company follows the handbook. And so you can't sue under the handbook. You can sue under the FMLA. Gotcha. So it is truly an amazing statute in that regard. Because you don't have to utter the magic words, FMLA. That's actually initials, Family and Medical Leave Act. You don't even have to use it in an email. I would like FMLA leave. You, if you send an email because you need time off, um, my, my spouse uh, is going to be needing medical care intermittently over the next six months, and I'm going to need to take some time off to care for him or her. You have now impose the obligation on the employer to give you the packet. Now, whether you use the packet, whether you go to the doctor to fill out the certification, that's up to you. But the employer, if they've given you the packet, has discharged their obligation. 
the employer doesn't even tell you you have the right, there's a violation of the FMLA. That's really important. I mean, if, if you get nothing else out of this hour, I hope you get this information out of it. The employer has an obligation to come to you. Now, it's best if you go to the employer, obviously. It's best if you need time off and you know you're going to need time off, um, whether it's by email or a form that the employer has, whatever. Something that's in writing, preferably for me. Uh, it's best that you do that. But if your best friend in the company tells your supervisor, uh, her husband you know, just had a heart attack and you know, he's in the hospital and you know, she was there all weekend, I'm not even sure she's going to be in this week. The employer now has the information necessary that obligates it to advise you of the FMLA and give you the paperwork, assuming 50 or more employees in a 75-mile radius, and you've worked there for at least a year, 1,250 hours, assuming those basics are met, the employer has the obligation to alert you to your rights. Very different type of statute. I mean, personally, I love it. What if you have not been there a year? No rights. No rights at all. Really? If you you know if the employer wow. gives you two weeks off, you know, and you want to take those two weeks, I guess you can do that. If the employer gives you two weeks off and you ask for them, and the employer says, "No, oh, not now. It's not convenient." Tough luck. I mean, I say that with regret. Tough luck. You have two choices: tolerate it and manage, or quit. Yeah, they used to tell us in television during the rating sweeps. No time off. And there are there are companies that say during this period of time, for whatever reason, you know, based upon the work you're doing, we don't give time off. And, you know, if if you have a child or a spouse or somebody, a parent, who now is going to need you to care for them, and you, you don't have 50 employees or you haven't worked there for a year, you have what is obviously a tough decision. Do you care for that person and lose your job or do you you know call aunt becky in idaho and beg her to come in and help you you know so that you can stay at your job it's a horrible decision to have to make and i would hope that an employer whether or not fmla is available would be reasonable enough and compassionate enough to offer that time you know even unpaid and the fmla is unpaid time you know, in the United States, we don't have a paid statute for leave. A lot of European countries do. We don't. Uh, it's been talked about by How some about of Greenland? The, oh. I don't know. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> they were going to be part of us, I thought, until the Danish prime minister said, we're not selling. And then, of course, the president cancels his state visit, you know, because he wanted to buy Greenland. He wanted to do a real estate deal as president. And, um, I'm not going to get into it. Well, see, I like Conan O'Brien saying. What did you he know, say? Just do a land swap. What? You know, it's it will we'll, we'll give uh, we'll give them Mar-a-Lago. You no, give us Greenland. We'll give the Dutch uh, Florida. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah. Ah, <laughs> uh, Yismir, that's Yiddish. All right. So then there are two types. We're running we're running low on time, folks. I'm not going to do what my son does. My son went to debate camp and he learned what's called spread debating, which is something I did back in high school. So I'm not going to do this. This is not the case with the FMLA. Under the FMLA, once the employer... <laughs> I'm not going to do that. I'll, I'll continue next week. <laughs> but that, that's debating these days. That's the old FedEx. We had, we had the first right. meeting yesterday of the debate team for L uh -oh. Lincoln Park Academy. Yeah, yeah. And we have some interesting new kids there. Uh, we have a sixth grader. Wait a minute. Sixth grader in debate? Yep. There was a... Wow. A, a tiny little young lady who was in the room for the meeting yesterday. And I just thought, you know, maybe she was a small ninth grader or something. And we were going around in there. People were introducing themselves. I'm in ninth grade, in IB. I'm in 10th grade, in IB. I'm in 11th grade, in IB. I mean, so we, three quarters of the team is in IB. So sure. I said to them, this is wonderful, because you're already academically committed if you're in IB. Yeah. So I guess if you're choosing speech and debate, you, you, you want to do something and accomplish something. So you have the incentive and the motivation, and I like that. And then we get around to this young lady at the very end, and she says she's in sixth grade. And I think to myself, wow. 
I just love it. A sixth oh, grader yeah. wanted to come to speech and debate. And so after the meeting, I, you know, I called her over and I asked her, I said, well, you know, I'm just, I'm glad to see you. I I'm, I'm, think you're going to enjoy this and we'll work, we'll work with you. And, you know, don't be intimidated by the fact that, you know, all these others are high schoolers. Um, but I'm curious, why are you here? And she said to me, I love to argue. <laughs> and I said, you're in the right place. <laughs> oh, my God. We'll, we'll teach you how to do it effectively, and you'll have some fun doing it, and you'll learn a lot of great skills. And if you do this all through middle school for the next three years, come, come ninth grade, you'll be kicking a lot of butt. Wow. Sixth grade. Yeah. I was very impressed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I certainly hope she stays. Um, I think it would be I, I think it's a wonderful opportunity for her and for the team to see somebody really committed that you wouldn't expect to necessarily pick an activity like this. Now would she be allowed to participate yes. in the state facility? She, she would be a novice. she would be a novice. Wow. She'd be in the novice division. And when we go to tournaments where they don't have the novice division, if she wanted to go, she'd be in varsity. Wow. And you know something? <laughs> Do I would I expect her to win in varsity? No. Did I expect any of our kids last year until the end when they finally started to play to really play? No. It's experience. You go up against people that much better than you, you're going to learn a few things. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, you know, if if this young lady or any of the people on the team who haven't done it before, you know, participate in varsity tournaments, that's great. I don't care that you lost the round. I'm going to look to see what the judges wrote about you. Because if they wrote some constructive, you need to work on X. We're going to help you work on that. I'm looking to see what the judges wrote. If the judge said, you know, you, you have a great speaking style, you know, you, you know, great vocal modulation, you know, good, good expression. Well, we're going to, we're going to work on helping you make that even better. Oh, dang. I'm down to one minute, folks. I could speak for another hour, but I think the rabbi would kick me out of this chair. So, we will continue this topic next week, the FMLA. We'll start um, this topic. We will, next well, week. We, we, got, we did a good part. Uh, until then, uh, thank you for listening, and uh, I hope you have a wonderful weekend and a good week and don't need a lawyer. But if you do, either give me a call next Friday to ask a lawyer or call my office at 781-8003. And this is Stuart Address saying goodbye and have a great time. Enjoy yourselves. You've been listening to Ask a Lawyer right here on WPSL, Port St. Lucie. The talk of the Treasure Coast, WPSL.com, worldwide. On Alexa and Google Home, and hello all of you folks listening in Oslo, Norway. Yeah.